Hello, and welcome to our webinar. I'm Larry Van Tassel, head of, the, head of the Department of Agricultural Economics and director of the Center for Agricultural Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Today is part of our center's weekly webinar series, which usually happens every Thursday at noon central. Check out the full schedule on our website at cap.unl.edu. In 2015, California passed sweeping legislation requiring the, pre the uh, preparation and implementation of gra local groundwater sustainability plans. The California Sustainable Grand Groundwater Management Act is now the most aggressive groundwater management law in the West and has features that may be worth considering in Nebraska. Presenting today is David Aiken, Agricultural Law and Water Law Specialist with the Center for Agricultural Profitability. He will walk through the SGMA and explain where there are policy disagreements between state and local officials and highlight features of the act that might be improvements to their Nebraska counterparts. Dave, thanks for presenting today. Hey, thank you, Larry. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Okay, does it look the way it's supposed to? Looks good. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. Um, this is a topic that's kind of fun for me. Uh, haven't done a lot of water law lately, although except for the South Platte River, but uh, this is a little bit of groundwater law, which, which will be fun because that's kind of where I used to specialize. Okay. Um, California is in the middle of a drought that began over 20 years ago. Uh, some scientists have said it's the worst drought in North America, I believe, in the last 1,200 years. So it's pretty bad. Uh, and uh, this led to legislation uh, adopted and signed by Governor Jerry Brown in, in 2014, taking effect in, Jan in uh, 2015, uh, called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SGMA for short. And basically, uh, it requires local uh, groundwater sustainability agencies to, uh, 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 in these groundwater basins that are facing uh, depletion issues uh, to prepare these sustainability plans to achieve uh, net yield, uh, net uh, sustained net yield by 2040 uh, with a 2015 baseline. And that likely will require pumping cutbacks by irrigators, uh, maybe municipalities, but probably not because they're not in the areas that are facing decline. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about the California law is that it protects domestic wells from groundwater declines. And that is something that is fairly unique. I don't think there is any Western state uh, that does that, certainly not as part of their groundwater depletion laws. Uh, right now, uh, proposed uh, groundwater plans are still being reviewed by the state and um, being revised by the, the local agencies. Okay, this graph just shows, you know, the drought in California and it's, you know, it's pretty much across the board. The yellow, uh, very few years or months that don't have at least the yellow, which is the mildest uh, uh, form of the drought. And you've seen that they've had some pretty bad you know, some the, the, the brown and the, and the, and the red uh, are the really dry years. And uh, they've had quite a few over the last couple of decades. This shows uh, a little bit of the, how the area affected by the drought, you know, has changed 
over the last 20 years uh, with the trend towards it, you know, covering more of the West. And if you, you know, if you look at the, the 2012, 2012 year for the, it was a bad drought year in Nebraska. And, uh, you know, Nebraska is not on the map, but you can see in the Colorado and, and stuff that, you know, that they were having drought and, and we were a part of that one too. And of course we're, it was pretty dry around here last year. Okay, um, for a long time, uh, there was no state role in terms of groundwater management in California. And in fact, uh, until this new law was passed in 2014, California was next to the bottom in terms of uh, groundwater depletion laws. You know, Texas was the worst and then California was the next to the worst. Uh, and that's, you know, that's kind of funny uh, or, or makes you scratch your head a little bit because, you know, California is, is way out in front, for example, on climate law and, you know, in environmental law generally, they've been very, very, you know, they've been very uh, progressive. But politically, you know, water law is a tougher nut to crack. And, uh, and it wasn't until they really, you know, drawn down all their surface water supplies from their storage reservoirs as a result of that long drought, which they're still in, of course. Uh, and then they have been had to pump the groundwater like crazy to try to keep up. And so, you know, uh, reservoir levels are down, groundwater levels are down. And, and uh, you know, they finally said, okay, we've got to do something. We can't just sit on our hands. And so that was when the law was passed. And the law applies, it doesn't apply to the groundwater basins that under California law have been adjudicated uh, in court to limit withdrawals to the safe yield, uh, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of the long-term net groundwater recharge, uh, which if we did that in Nebraska, that would, we'd have to really cut back on our groundwater pumping uh, because our net recharge is not, is not a whole lot compared to what we pump out in at least in some areas of the state. But I think most of those adjudicated basins, uh, you know, the cities, the city use is the is the main groundwater use. And, and so that was the, that's what led to those uh, adjudications. We don't have a lot of uh, purely ag uh, groundwater adjudications in California. Um, there's well over 100 basins, uh, individual groundwater basins in, in California, and 21 have been identified as critical, and, and most of them are in the Central Valley, and so that's that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna take a look at in today, uh, what those ag heavy uh, Central Valley uh, basins came up with for groundwater plants, and under the law, you know there is state backup. If the local plan is inadequate, according to the state, then the state can come in and put the local groundwater uh, sustainability agency uh, base uh, put the basin in probationary status and and come up with a state plan, you know, to to be implemented until the local plan the local can come up with a plan that gets state approval. So there is a there is a strong state role. The local agencies have the first crack at it and practical matter probably the second third crack at it too but if they don't break through to to make the tough decisions that they probably need to achieve sustainability then they're then the state's going to do it until you know the local says all right we can't dodge this any longer we got to do it ourselves okay here's a map of all the groundwater basins in in california of course california among other things is the land of many earthquakes so they've got a very fractured geological situation. So that's why they have so many basins. Uh, you can see the Central Valley here in the middle. Uh, that's where a lot of the irrigated ag is in California. Um, okay, this map is uh, all the colored areas are the areas that have to prepare the groundwater sustainability plans. Here's the, again, here's the Central Valley. Uh, and then here's, Here's the map that focuses on the Central Valley. Uh, and, and what I did for today was that I looked at what the state had done for all of the plans that have been submitted by these 11 Central Valley uh, counties. 
and it's you know the purple county the, the, the purple areas the purple counties on the map and uh and and looked what the state and looked at what the state did but these are ag you know the the la is not in any of these counties you know none of the big cities in california are, are in any of these purple counties so they're they're pretty much ag uh, now one big challenge uh, that California has is that they don't have anything comparable to our natural resource districts. They don't have you know, regional, well, they have too many uh, regional water uh, districts that do all kinds of things and that are, you know, up to now, they'd all been kind of doing their own thing and, and not really worried about anybody else or uh, anything like that. And so they, and uh, so just about any district, uh, as well as any local government, you know, uh, communities, counties, uh, you know, they can all be groundwater sustainability agencies if they want to. And so one of the big issues that they've had is that in a lot of these, well, just in the Central Valley ones that I looked at, they might, they might have three or four proposed plans each that would each deal with part of the overall groundwater basin, but these these four or five or six uh, sub-basin plans were in no way coordinated or you know have common objectives or anything. And so, you know, if there was one agency that was in charge of each uh, of each groundwater basin, then that would make it a lot easier to get going in terms of developing a plan and so forth. But they spent the first couple of years figuring out who was going to be at the table and developing these groundwater plans, whether they were going to develop their own individual plans or whether they'd all work together on a collective plan. And, uh, you know, they're still, it's still kind of a mess and they're still going to be, uh, uh, that it's, that's probably going to change, uh, you know, as this as this regulatory process moves forward. Okay, I thought it would be fun to just briefly compare groundwater use in uh, California and Nebraska. Uh, you know, they have 79% of their uh, groundwater pumping for uh, agriculture, which I assume includes uh, uh, irrigation and livestock watering. Uh, maybe it's just irrigation, but that compares to 94 in Nebraska, 19%. Uh, uh, in California, the groundwater is municipal compared to 4% in Nebraska. So clearly those, you know, Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, all those, all those Southern California communities, uh, you know, they all, they all rely on groundwater for a bunch, if not all of their municipal supplies. And we're talking millions and millions of people. So that's a lot of groundwater. I mean, it's, you know, that's a, obviously a much larger urban sector uh, than we have in Nebraska. Uh, and I suspect if we could get numbers for just the Central Valley, uh, that would probably look a lot more like Nebraska, that you know, 90% of the groundwater use in the Central Valley is probably for irrigation, uh, which would put it you know, pretty close to where we are in Nebraska. Okay, Central Valley, uh, also known as the uh, uh, San Joaquin Valley, uh, and this is where uh, most of the groundwater depletion is occurring uh, in California. And uh, that's, that's probably not a big surprise because that's where most of the uh, irrigated agriculture is. You know, it's, it's where a lot of the vineyards are and the wineries and, and all this kind of stuff, as well as all the fruits and vegetables and nuts and, and all the other stuff that they grow in Colorado, excuse me, California, that we don't grow in Nebraska. You know, so it's so they've got, you know, their agriculture is is a little more complicated than our agriculture is in Nebraska, and it's you know they've got a lot of, uh, you know, well the the grape orchards and stuff, but you know that's their kind of special problems, special issues associated with them. Anyway, the University of California uh, did a study of the plans, uh, the proposed plans in the Central Valley. And uh, they they estimated uh, that you know the overdraft annual overdraft was 11 percent of the annual withdrawals, uh, which 
you know, I mean, it sounds like it's 11%. That's a cutback that would hurt. Uh, no doubt it, it would not be costless, but it, at the same time, it's not going to pull the plug uh, on everything. So, you know, it, it's something that they can, I think that they'll be able to come up with some plans and stuff that are uh, uh, sustainable on the long term. Uh, but anyway, the, the university can that's just my opinion. Uh, that's the University of California uh, said that uh, they thought that recharge, which is what all the plans said they're going to do, how they're going to deal with uh, uh, overdraft uh, or depletion. Uh, they're going to bring in surface water to recharge the groundwater, and then that would bring the groundwater levels back up, and so they wouldn't have to do any pump, uh, pumping cutbacks. Uh, uh, well, the University of California study that that could deal with, you know, two and a half or three percent, you know, or roughly twenty-five percent of the overdraft. Uh, that's how much surface water that there was available uh, that might that could be converted to uh, uh, recharge. And you know, they're talking about for some of the water, they're talking about buying out surface water irrigators, uh, and so that's not going to be cheap. Uh, buying, buying their water from them and using it for recharge. But anyway, that that could cover about 25% of the overdraft. Uh, and then uh, demand management or or reducing the pumping uh, would, would have to take care of the rest of it for about three-fourths. Uh, the plans flip that. The plan said that recharge is going to take care of 75% of the overdraft. And, and if we still have uh, depletion after that, then we'll maybe think about doing something in terms of cutting back on how much groundwater we pump. Uh, but there's not enough water for them to do that. So that's kind of a that's kind of a pipe dream, but it also shows that the plans are not very well coordinated. Uh, so certainly across the region. You know, if they're all trying to say they're all going to use the same water for recharge, that's going to be kind of hard to do. So uh, there's there's 11 counties uh, in the Central Valley, uh, 10 of them had their plans reviewed, uh, and uh, the last one is still under the under state review. Uh, so I looked at the at the reviews of the 10 plans. The plans are very long. They're, they're between 1,200 and, and 2,000 pages long, so I didn't review every plan. Uh, I didn't even look at every plan, but, uh, you know, the state reviews, you know, that's a two or three page letter and then a a 20 to 50 page uh, staff report with with each for each one. I did look at those. Um, and of all of the plans within the Central Valley that had been submitted, uh, all 10 of them were deemed incomplete, uh, which means that they didn't have enough in there to achieve sustainability. Uh, and so they've got six months uh, to to uh, uh, revise them and resubmit them. And uh, if if they don't get it if they don't get it as uh, correct as far as the state is concerned the second time around, then their uh, the plans would be deemed in, uh, inadequate. Excuse me, and the basins would be put on probation. And uh, you know the, there's another process that they go through with the state officials, but uh, one option would be is that they'd have another six months to come up with another revised plan. And if that still doesn't do it, then the state writes their own plan. And, you know, it reminded me a lot of my teaching, uh, you know, uh, the plans in terms of what was wrong with them is that they, it seemed like all the plans uh, that were deemed incomplete, you know, they wanted, they wanted to see if they could get by with doing the same with doing the minimum required. You know, they thought that they could do if they do the minimum, this will make the state happy. You know, then they won't have to change anything what they're doing. And they would say that you know, well, if it's sustainable, you know, if we're de if we're depleting groundwater three percent a year, if we don't, if, if groundwater depletion never exceeds three percent a year, you know, we can hold it at three percent, and that's sustainable. And yeah, it's sustainable till they you know till they run out till it's too deep to pump. Um, and you know they played games with defining sustainability to let them do what they wanted to do and stuff like that. And the state 
obviously saw through those and said, no, no, that's you're not sustainable. Uh, so, you know, you're inadequate. Uh, fix it or, or we're going to do it for you. And uh, again, that reminds me of the students, you know, for the first hour exam. Uh, and I weren't and I warned about this in class. I say, you know, there's a bunch of you who are going to say, well, I'm going to see if I can study the minimum amount, you know, that I need to to get a good grade on this test. And they get, you know, and they get a 50 or a 60, you know, on the first test. And, you know, I, back in the day, there were only three hour exams. And so if you flunk the first test, it's pretty hard to get up to a, I mean, you are never going to get up to a B. You're going to have, you'd struggle to get up to a C. So they basically dug themselves a hole that they couldn't get out. That's why I went to four exams so that they had an extra exam so that they could, you know, end up a little closer to a B at the end. But, you know, it seems to be human nature. We, if it's something we don't want to do, you know, we try to do the minimum. And, uh, and if that doesn't work, then, uh, you know, then we're kind of not in a good place, but, you know, uh, we have to deal with what it is then. And some of these revised plans could be uh, coming back for state review as early as July. So I'll be watching that to see what happens. Uh, and, and, but it, you know, hopefully the, the, the state in these, you know, when they said, no, it's inadequate, they were pretty clear about what needed to change and what the changes needed to look like. So it, uh, we'll see if they, if, uh, if they take the suggestions of the state and, and work and try to try to do it that way, you know, then there, there could be a lot of plans to get, get approved the second time around, but you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Okay, so how could they do it? I'm, I'm talking like cutting back, it would be a piece of cake. Well, it's really hard, you know, I mean, it, it's, uh, we, we know that in Nebraska, uh, but I mean, if you've thought about it, you know, telling people that they get, they don't get as much as they want, they, that's never what they want to hear, you know, that's uh, like, like my doctor telling me, you know, as he did, you know, 20 years ago, you need to go on a diet and quit eating all this bad stuff that you eat. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've gained weight, I haven't lost weight. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I know better than anybody else. But anyway, how could they do it? Well, the first way that I've got is, is uh, you know, how we, how it's been done in Nebraska by metering the wells and then having pumping limits. And typically in the, you know, the, the, they're given uh, an amount over three years. So say it's, 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 it averages out, you get 30 inches over three years. So that averages out to 10 inches here. And, and you can, you know, if it's a wet year, you pump less. If it's dry, you pump more. And hopefully it evens out. But it's got a balance at the end, or if you go in the hole, then you lose the water the next time around, as well as you know, maybe you have to pay some fees or something. That's one way to do it. And they talk about allocation, uh, and so they've picked up some of the Nebraska language. Uh, you know, when they were meeting with Nebraska officials to learn more about our groundwater and for that. Uh, another way to do it is to uh, put a fee or a tax on groundwater withdrawals and increasing the tax over time uh, until, until you've reduced withdrawals to the point to where you've reached, reached whatever that level of sustainability is for your basin. And, you know, that's one way to do it. You know, a, a, a comms like that, they say that, that it would be efficient. Uh, another way to do it, uh, is put a, a, a tax on the pumping, and then the groundwater sustainability agency, whatever whatever it is, uh, you know whether it's a you know, groundwater recharge district, a surface water irrigation district, whatever whoever the, the GSA is, it may be a conglomeration of all the different groundwater players in the uh, uh, in the uh, basin. Uh, you know that they they take the money that they get from this pump tax and then purchase uh, groundwater out, purchase and retire groundwater allocations or pumping rights. Uh, and they do that over time until they've retired enough groundwater rights voluntarily, uh, which is nice, uh, to, uh, to achieve the sustainable level of groundwater pumping. And, and that would be my, my, I call it my number two favorite taxes to accomplish this, and the first one as well, would probably be 
too high you know, for most districts uh, to implement because you know irrigators are the directors on these districts uh, in these ground on in most of these groundwater sustainability agencies. So they're you know they're they're not going to be real thrilled about doing that, and they probably won't do it till their back is against the wall and the gun is at their head. Uh, or unless the state comes in and, and does it, and then if the state comes in and does it, then they can say, okay, well we'll just we'll we'll continue doing we'll agree to continue doing what the state's done, and, and so they can get off probation that way. But they tell everybody, hey, this is the state plan, and we you know we don't have it's either the state doing it or we're doing it, so. We didn't really have a choice. Um, another one would be to uh, reduce allocations to a sustainable level over time. Uh, so you, that people, maybe everybody starts off with 10 inches and then nine, and then eight, you know, and, and it reduced, it, it goes down over time until you're at six maybe, which might be your sustainable level. Uh, and then allow the allocations to be sold. And that's my that's my personal favorite. Uh, it's you know you don't have these high taxes on the groundwater withdrawals, which irrigators are going to have their back on, and you know. But frankly, they're going to they're going to have to choose. They're going to have to choose something like a a, a tough allocation uh, or pumping limit that's going to be reduced over time, or the uh, pumping limit that has huge fees on it if you go over the limit. Uh, or a tax that's across the board that's going to go up until the pumping goes down to a level that, that achieves sustainability. And uh, it'll be very interesting to, for me to see what happens uh, with this, uh, whether they'll do something like this or whether they'll do something else. Uh, you know, they're all going to want to say, well, we're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to buy water from surface irrigators and stuff like that. But that's, that's a, uh, saying they're going to do it and, and coming up with the money to do it and, and finding a willing seller is, is you know that's all that's all kind of a challenge okay so will the plans actually limit groundwater pumping and this is just a, a, a newsletter that i get uh that uh san uh, joaquin valley or s uh jv uh water news something like that uh, email newsletter, uh, very very interesting, uh, very helpful. But anyway, uh, you see there, you see the headline, then you see down there, uh, and that's what they're talking, what that article talks about. And it's the East Kiowa uh, Groundwater Sustainability Agency, and they come up with a uh, with a pumping limit of ten inches an acre. Uh, however, there are two other uh, groundwater sustainability agencies within the same groundwater basin and they don't have they they say well you know if we have to you know five or ten or twenty years down the road if we have to we'll look at putting a limit on groundwater pumping but we're not going to do it now the state says you've got to be you know you've got to have a, a, a plan for the basin so the, the fact that the one the one Subbasin plan was pretty good. Was not enough for the other two subbasins. You know, you know the other two subbasins basically flunked. So the whole thing flunked. So that's a, and that's a that's kind of a common story. Um, another county, uh, Madera County. Uh, interesting name. We don't have Madera counties in Nebraska, but I, you know, but we do have wineries in Nebraska. So you know, why not? Um, anyway. Uh, they proposed to cap pumping at about 20 inches an acre and then reducing that over time to about 10 inches an acre uh, by 2035. But there are six, I call them sister uh, groundwater sustainability agencies within the same groundwater basin. Uh, and same thing, they, they, weren't, they weren't willing to cap theirs. Uh, they were not going to you know, they would say, well, if we have to later on, we will, but you know, we're not doing it now. Uh, and so the plan was inadequate, even though one of the sub-basin plans came in with something that, that looked pretty reasonable. So uh, one of the big challenges that they have uh, there, and you know, it's not unlike the issues that, that potential issues, at least in the Republican basin in Nebraska, 
is that some, you know, some of the irrigators get uh, ditch water uh, from these reservoirs and uh, that the state operates for irrigation and flood control. And uh, other, and so their, their wells are just supplemental wells. Um, other irrigators are strictly on the wells. So, uh, you know, the, the people with supplemental wells say, well, everybody should get the same groundwater allocation. Uh, and the guys who are just, who don't get ditch water say, no, you guys are on the ditch. So you don't need as much groundwater as, as those of us who just have wells. So, and, and they can't find, they can't come to agreement in terms of what that, uh, what that allocation should look like. Is it the same across the board? Uh, is, or are the people with supplemental wells going to get less? Uh, how much less are they going to get? You know, are they going to get half? Are they going to get less than half? You know, who knows? But that, you know, that was something that they, you know, couldn't reach agreement on. And, and, uh, and it's kind of tough. And, you know, it's easy for me to say, well, you know, they can put a tax on it and, you know, raise the tax to drive down the pumping and stuff like that. But there are lots of practical implementation issues at the local level that make it that make it complicated and, and, and more complicated than than professors would uh, maybe like to imagine uh, that it is. Okay, now we're going to take a quick look at the Indian Wells Valley, and you can see it's outside of the Central Valley. Uh, it's basically it's basically in the desert. And the reason we're going to look at it is that it is the only plan that has been approved uh, so far that is, you know, that has a substantial irrigation component. But, you know, the, the plan is to phase out irrigation uh, by 2040, to phase out irrigation in 20 years. And uh, which is not the, <laughs> excuse me, which is not the kind of plan that most irrigators would be, would be real happy to see. But the plan, you know, the irrigation pumping is 62% of the total pumping in the basin. Uh, and that's going to be, that's going to be cut, reduced to zero by 2040. And the remaining pumping will be by, you know, will for, be for municipalities, which are small, and a Navy base, which is probably uh, uh, the single biggest user of water in the, uh, in the, the basin. Now, there have been about a million lawsuits filed against this plan, uh, mainly from, from irrigators. Uh, interestingly, the uh, local uh, groundwater sustainability agency has filed for a court adjudication of their sustained yield, which is an option under uh, California law. And you basically go in and, and make your pitch and then the court decides how much water everybody gets. Uh, and to make sure that the, that the amount being pumped is sustainable over an indefinite period of time. So uh, the plan's been approved, but uh, what it will look like when all the dust settles is hard to see and the dust is not likely to settle anytime soon because these, these California groundwater cases take a long time. Uh, you know, they're very complicated cases, lots of technical witnesses and stuff. It's, it's about like our lawsuit with, with uh, Kansas over the uh, over the uh, Republican River. You know, I mean that that thing went on for several years, and uh, these would be the same sort of thing. Now, there's a lot of effort that goes into preparing these plans. Uh, you know, you've got to you've got to have a groundwater model or have a consultant who can uh, take the groundwater models that the state has and and work with them in terms of looking at options and stuff like that. You know, play what playing what if, but it's you know you can't do it in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and the state has basically foot the bill for all of this. Uh, so uh, none of the local agencies have had to raise taxes, uh, at least as, as near as I can tell. Uh, they haven't had to raise taxes. If they had, it's been you know not raised taxes a lot in order to to pay for. The, the planning and the analytical work that goes into developing these local groundwater plants. Uh, you know, if they'd had to, if they'd had to raise taxes a lot to do it, <laughs> you know, that, that probably would have killed it, uh, killed it right there. And they would have sent it back to the legislature and say, fix this because that's not gonna work. 
Uh, states also uh, providing millions and millions of dollars to purchase farmland and retire it. So you can purchase irrigated farmland and retire the water rights uh, associated with that. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, so there's all kinds of stuff that's available, but still a very hot potato uh, for the, the, the folks who are on these uh, local groundwater agency boards. Okay, one of the things that really jumped out at me uh, about the California uh, groundwater, uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is that, is that it protects uh, domestic wells um, during, you know, in, in areas where groundwater is being depleted. Uh, there are six undesirable results in the law uh, from groundwater depletion that the plans have to prevent from happening. Uh, you know, one of them is drying up of the domestic wells. Another one is land subsidence, and they have problems in California with these you know, concrete canals uh, cracking uh, and, and you know, not being able to deliver water because of the land. Land underneath the canal is subsided, and the canal is just falling into, into the sinkhole, so to speak. Uh, Seawater intrusion in coastal areas, you know, if the groundwater level gets too low, the more salt water comes in to fill the gap. And uh, you know that creates, you know, makes the the fresh water saline uh, and not drinkable. So, so keeping the groundwater levels high enough to keep the, the salt water out is a, is another one. Uh, groundwater quality changes. You know they have salinity problems with irrigation in parts of California. Uh, Surface water depletion, uh, you know, where the groundwater pumping reduces flows in a, in a, in a river. Uh, and then, you know, long-term uh, depletions of uh, groundwater storage. Uh, those are the, all of the undesirable results. We're just gonna look here at the domestic well protection. And going back to the University of California study, uh, they said none of the plans proposed to deal with, the, to protect domestic wells. Uh, and, and the state said the same thing when we reviewed the plans, uh, CDWR is the California Department of Water Resources, they're the ones that had the major role in implementing the, uh, the, the Sustainable Water Management Act in California. Uh, they're the ones who reviewed all the plans. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the attitude reflected in the plans uh, is, is a very similar attitude that we see in Nebraska is that, you know, well, you know, we irrigators have never uh, had to uh, pay neighbors to deepen their domestic wells or anything like that. If, if the irrigation equipment dries up the well, I mean, not unless they go to court. Uh, and so, you know, everybody sort of has to take care of their own and, and uh, that's the way it should be. And, and some of the plans basically came out and said that. They said, you know, they said, we've never had to worry about those wells, so we're not going to worry about them now. We don't care what the law is. Uh, and at least one uh, groundwater, local groundwater sustainability agency has sent a letter to the state saying, we're not going to protect domestic wells in our plan. And uh, uh, if you don't like it, uh, you know, if you try to make us do it, we're going to take you to court. And so, you know, that's, that's you know, there have been a lot of lawsuits filed as a result of this law, and, and, and this is one saying that we shouldn't have to protect domestic wells. But in reviewing the plans, one thing that's very interesting, uh, one, uh, one GSA suggested that, well, you know, if we have to, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll you know, the state has this program to help domestic wells uh, that are having trouble pumping during dry seasons, uh, you know, that we'll, we'll have a local, um, Cost share uh, that will uh, that would that we'd use in conjunction with what with the state program, uh, and bait, and the takeaway from that to me is that you know if the if the, uh, uh, if the basically the irrigators say okay uh, take care of the domestic wells you know if the domestic wells have problem during the drought you know we'll pay to get the wells deepened uh, as as part of our uh, groundwater program. Uh, and and, uh, and this, uh, the 
state said, basically said, yeah, if you do something like that, uh, that's that looks like something that we could approve. Uh, and so, you, you know, that that's undesirable result that that we can check off your list. And, you know, to me, you know, being the lawyer and say, oh, man, that's a loophole. You know, uh, you say we're going to take care of the domestic wells. Uh, that's going to give you a lot of leeway in terms of uh, uh, how long do you have to achieve sustainability or, you know, what level, how much uh, do you have to make groundwater levels come back to avoid all these undesirable results? You know, if you can avoid all these undesirable results at a lower level because at a lower groundwater level because you've you know, taken care of all these domestic wells, uh, you know, man, that's something to look at. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, if you took the domestic well protection to the extreme, you're, you're saying that they would have to have fairly high groundwater levels uh, and you know, because most of the domestic wells are, are pretty shallow, they're not deep like the domestic, like the irrigation wells. So, you know, it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see how many of the plans they see that as being, if not exactly a loophole, at least something that, that, that gives them a better chance of getting their plan approved. And so that's, uh, that's something to take a look at. And something that would be similar to that would say, well, we'll put in a rural water district and we'll supply rural water district water to these people that have the wells so they don't need to use their wells anymore or they can just use their wells for supplemental or whatever, but they can go on the water district and not have to worry about that. We'll see. Okay, well, it you know in in Nebraska, domestic is the number one protected use. But uh, to on the groundwater side, uh, if I have a domestic well and, and my neighbor irrigator dries up my well, um, I have to take if they don't agree to help me out on on deepening my well, uh, then I have to taken to court to show, and then I have to prove in court uh, through expert witnesses and, and stuff that that well is what, that irrigation well is what caused my domestic well to go dry and for it needs to be deep in 50 feet or whatever it happens to be. And you have to do that in court. And, and if the uh, lawyer representing the irrigator is on the ball, he or she will say, well, we want a jury trial for this, which pushes it at least six, an additional six months out, you know, uh, if you go to do it without a jury, you can get a trial date a lot faster. But if you have to say a jury trial, it's going to take a week or something, uh, then you go way out on the judge's calendar before they can find a free week that you can, that you can have for the trial. So, uh, and the domestic well owners, you know, they're hauling water and stuff, trying to keep everything going and, and saying that, well, maybe we have our day in court in a year, uh, like I say, all oh, the heck, the heck with it. I'll just, you know, I'll just do it myself and, and forget about the lawsuit. And uh, that's why this hasn't gone to court uh, very many times in Nebraska. Uh, if it, you know, it, it has been a few times, but not a lot. Now, NRDs have broad enough groundwater management authority that they they could come up with their own program to to help domestic wells. Uh, during droughts that could be maybe patterned after what they do in California or uh, uh, something like that. But they could, you know, they could, they could have a domestic well program say, if your domestic well is, you know, if it's, if it's checked uh, every year and, it, and, and, it's, and it's on a regular maintenance schedule and everything like that, uh, and it's already drilled to a reasonable depth, uh, then, you know, if you have trouble during the irrigation season, we will help you pay to deepen the well to, you know, so it's deep enough to where you can get water, you know, even during the heavy irrigation cover. Um, you know, they don't have to do it, uh, but they could do it. Uh, and if they could do it, it would be legal in my opinion. So that'd be, that would be nice. That would be great to happen uh, in my opinion, because you know, domestic well owners don't do anything to contribute to groundwater depletion, either, you know, the big, uh, groundwater drops during the irrigation season or over the long term, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of innocent bystanders there. Uh, and if they're not irrigators themselves, so, you know, they're not getting any benefits, much benefit from the 
the neighbor's irrigation and just, you know, they've got a big expense in, in with the new well. So it would seem to, to me, it would be NRDs could do something to try to address that uh, uh, inequity. But uh, that's just uh, doing something at the state level, you know, our political culture is almost the exact opposite of the political culture in, 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 in uh, California. They're the only Western state that I know of that does anything that really helps on the ground to try to protect domestic wells. And so, you know, that's that's uh, uh, getting that through the Nebraska legislature would be kind of a miracle. Okay, so what's going to happen? What's the next step in California? Well, they, you know, they're uh, they have most of them. The 10 of the 11 are in their 180 days to revise the plan and get it back to the state to see if it uh, to see if it uh, uh, achieves the sustainability objectives that the law requires. Um, if it doesn't, if the state turns it down again, uh, then you know they'll powwow with the, with, the, with the state agencies. The, Department of Water Resources and the Water Resource Control Board, uh, who are the two agencies that come up with a, a temporary plan if the, if the local plan doesn't meet the state requirements. Uh, and so really it'll be interesting to see what happens with these next uh, first revision of the, of the plans, you know, if they've taken any meaningful steps towards trying to achieve sustainability or uh, whether the, or, you know, whether that's more of the same, just do the minimum, uh, try to do the minimum to get approved and no more, uh, which, which probably won't be enough. Uh, and then it'll be interesting to see if any of these lawsuits are get far enough along to where there's some court rulings or something like that. That will also be that will also be interesting as well. Uh, but it's uh, you know, it, the law has grand ambitions uh, and uh, it's. Not going to be an easy thing to accomplish, but 11 percent uh, reductions is is uh, to achieve sustainability. It seems like something that uh, that they ought to be able to figure out how to do in California. And far, uh, you know, I I don't know what depletion rates are in Nebraska to, to, to compare it to that, but uh, you know it, it's something that that they are that is. Uh, is doable, but it's it's you know it's it's going to be a challenge, and, and but I think they're up to it. Okay, questions or comments? Yeah, Dave, we have a few uh, questions here for you. First of all, uh, why wouldn't California incentivize private businesses to utilize ocean water versus destroying its ag industry? Okay, they are. I mean. Uh, Walter, water desalinization is a big deal in California and has been at least for the last 50 years. Uh, and, you know, I would say that if they're not far enough along or it's not cheap enough to, uh, you know, to, to, to do that. But if you look at the Central Valley, it's not industry that's causing the groundwater depletion or overdraft. You know, it's it's the irrigation pumping. So, um, if they if they could desalinize enough water and it got cheap enough to where farmers could use it, uh, then that might be a possibility. But that's, and I'm sure there are probably plans that say, yeah, we think that somebody's going to figure out they're you know they're gonna they're gonna uh, get desalinization to where it's feasible and stuff, and then we're going to use all that uh, uh, all that. Uh, Cleaned up uh, seawater, reclaimed seawater to to recharge. They are pretty uh, aggressive in California. I'll, I'll bet in these groundwater, uh, well, in the Central Valley, I'll bet every community uh, has um, some sort of groundwater recharge plan where they take their treated sewage and then and use it as a source of groundwater recharge. Uh, the problem is in the Central Valley is they don't have Los Angeles or you know any of those bigger communities to where they would generate enough sewage to where it could be a significant enough amount of recharge to where it would really offset some of this uh, uh, depletion. But the depletion 
but at least in the Central Valley, is really from the uh, is really is from the irrigation. All right. So, Dave, as allocations are reduced, is there any potential to promote equity for indigenous groups, people of color, women, co-ops, etc.? They they are. They are on that in California. And in fact, that's one of the reasons I think they have such a strong uh, domestic well protection element in the plan. I mean, it is far and away above uh, you know, anything that I've seen. But you know, tribes can be uh, GSAs and uh, tribes are you know, uh, where they have where they're located and if they're, you know, where they have land and, and, and water rights and stuff like that, they're part of the GSA group in that basin. Uh, so, you know, they're involved. Uh, there was a, a handout, you know, the, the state has a bunch of handouts on different aspects of the uh, Groundwater Sustainability Act uh, program. And one of them was, you know, uh, for tribes in terms of, you know, how they, fit into the process and you know what their options were and stuff like that. So uh, they, I think California is probably ahead of most states uh, in terms of that. Uh, but if they, if they hold firm on the groundwater, uh, on the domestic well protection, uh, that'll, that'll help a lot because, you know, there's a lot of uh, all kinds of people in, in, in rural California. Uh, uh, and so protecting those domestic wells would be would be uh, would be a big deal and, and would cut across all the different uh, ethnic and, and, and racial uh, categories. Okay, what generally happens to ag land that is retired and the water rights purchased? Do they go back to dry land farming, or is it for uh, land going to municipal development? It's both, I think. Uh, but in a lot, you know, in many areas in California, dryland farming is, is, you know, is desert or, or pasture um, or sagebrush, I guess. Uh, you know, the, the dryland options are, are not super in most parts of California. Um, some of that land could go, in, could go into development, uh, but yeah, it would, it, if it didn't go, if it didn't go into, uh, into sub suburban development or something like that, then it would be, you know, the, the significant loss of value and 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 uh, you know the property taxes on the land would be down uh, as, quite a bit as well. Mm -hmm. They, I think they see that as kind of a conservation and habitat type thing. So they would probably, you know, there there's probably some some habitat dimension to it that I'm just not familiar with. Okay. Well, Dave, it sounds like you don't really see uh, Nebraska gaining any irrigation management insight from SGMA. Is, is that accurate? Well, right now, that's a that's a pretty <laughs> that's a pretty penetrating question. I'll say, um, on the irrigation side, I'm not sure that they have. You know that they're doing anything or talking about things that that haven't been talked about in Nebraska. When I started out looking into this, I was hopeful, you know, that there would be maybe two or three or four kind of different things that they have in terms of irrigation management that would that would provide kind of range and and would be things that we could look at in Nebraska as as some options and. Uh, now my hope is that in this second generation of the uh, sustainable uh, groundwater plans that come out, uh, that maybe we'll see some of that. Uh, but we haven't seen no, we haven't seen it in the first go around, and, and the only one, uh, the the Indian Wells one is, you know, say, well, we're gonna we're gonna zero out the irrigation in 20 years. Uh, that's not a that's not a great plan either. I mean, I'll, that'd be one they have in a group of four or five. You have that as the extreme, but uh, but I was hoping for some other stuff where they would have pumping fees or or do something that's a little different than what we've done in Nebraska. So I'm still keeping my fingers crossed. 
So Dave, do you know how independent the aquifers are underneath each water district in California? Should the water management plans be more coordinated or how integrated are they given the aquifer? Yeah, their geologic situation is very different from ours. Uh, and probably, probably couldn't be more different. I mean, we both states have a lot of groundwater, but there's, you know, if we had a bunch of earthquakes in Nebraska, uh, groundwater management would be more complicated here because it'd be our our aquifers would be very fragmented. Uh, their aquifers are, are pretty fragmented in California, and so that's the that's the problem that they have. So they've got you know hundreds of basins, um, and really they're just looking for sustainability within each basin, basin by basin, you know, and they figure if they can get it done at the basin level, you know, then, then they'll have gotten it done at the state level, but it's not that there's, you know, they can come up with one thing at the state level that will work for every basin and fix it. So I think the, you know, their, the earthquake fragmentation of their, of their, groundwater supplies is, is a big difference uh, and you know and and it mean and you know I don't I haven't gotten into the individual basins well enough to know uh, you know if you've got three or four or five different groups that are taken doing a piece of the of the basin I mean one of the problems is that they all come up with five different plans uh, and then the state says you don't have a plan. You've got five sub plans, and uh, if you can find a way to put those five plans together into kind of an overall plan uh, that you know doesn't have any bad results, like drying up the domestic wells or uh, whatever, uh, then you know you know if you do that, then then you can get approved. But uh, if you have come in with five different plans that don't really work together, uh, that's you know that's not going to do it. Okay. Now, one last question here for you, Dave. Is there a consideration either in California or Nebraska for groundwater quality when deepening a domestic well? In other words, they might be able to drill it deeper, but the quality may be poor. Yeah, they do. They do. Uh, they they're very concerned about that in Colorado. In excuse me, California. So you know they're they're aware of that as an issue. Uh, uh, in the you know in in Nebraska you know it, it's kind of everybody's on their own. Uh, if 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 everybody has to go deeper and and uh, and when you go deeper the water is bad for domestic water, uh, then maybe the NRD needs to come in with a rural water district or something mm -hmm. to try to come up with a supply of better drinking water for everybody. All right. Well, thank you, Dave, for the insights you've gained. We really appreciate that today. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. A recording of the webinar will be posted at cap.unl.edu, where you can also register for other upcoming webinars. We'd appreciate it if you would click on the link in the chat box uh, to take a brief survey to provide feedback on this webinar and to inform uh, us uh, regarding our upcoming sessions. Thanks again for joining us and I hope everybody has a great afternoon.